Our next uh, session is about memristors in the brain. And uh, our first speaker is the uh, gentleman who invented or discovered or characterized memristors in 1971, I believe, as the Fourth Circuit element. He's very well known for that. And uh, I, we have a mistake. He, he's actually from UC Berkeley, not UCSF. Uh, and I'm pleased to introduce Professor Leon Chua speaking on brains are made of memristors. Let's welcome Professor Chua. Uh, thank you, Stuart, for inviting me to give this uh, talk, even though I knew nothing about consciousness. Uh, but I'll try to give you a brief introduction of what um, Member Resource is all about. And uh, Professor Tusinski will then follow uh, to tell you why microtubers are, in fact, uh, Member So uh, let me just uh, move on. Uh, it, just go back quickly, his prehistoric time. Uh, that means that toward the end of the, the 60s, there were crises in circuit theory in the sense that all of a sudden there were two Nobel Prize papers that both led to uh, problems uh, in, this, uh, in the circuit analysis in the sense that uh, using the pre-1970 definitions of uh, this cap capacitor and resistor inductor would actually give wrong answers and solutions when the elements uh, are either nonlinear or time varying. And you will see one of these examples later today. That's the famous Huskin Huxley equation. So let me move on just to remind you that this is the three classic circuit elements that all of us learned from high school days. And I would point special attention well, all three definitions are, are, turn out to be incorrect. It's only correct when the element is linear. When they're nonlinear or time varying, uh, you would get incorrect answers. But I want to focus today on Ohm, everybody, on Ohm's law, uh, which is the voltage is resistance on current, or current is a conductance of the voltage. And the problem that occurs is when this, uh, when, uh, this resistance is either nonlinear, that's non-monotonic, or when it's time varying, you would get incorrect or nonsense uh, in the measurements. Okay, so to resolve the crisis, uh, we actually have to uh, use what I call an axiomatic approach. And this approach is independent of the elements, the materials or the structure. That's why they're timeless. In other words, there will be no possibility of contradictions in the future. Okay, so let me start by saying what is this, how I define this element. Uh, start with the, uh, a two-terminal device. Imagine you have only two wires. You're not supposed to know anything inside. For in an axiomatic approach, you're supposed to start with an axiom, an undefined concept. So the undefined concept are the voltage and current. And it's undefined in the sense that you are not supposed to know anything about what the voltage or current is, let alone what electric field is. All you need to know is that there is such a thing that is called a voltmeter, and there's such a thing called an ammeter that you can go buy from Radio Shack. Those are the undefined concepts. And whatever you measure from the voltmeter is called voltage. And whatever you measure from current is called a current I. Those are the symbols that I picked because happen to be the same as the natural, uh, the, the classic definition. But once you can measure current, you can certainly integrate it with a computer, and what Ever that comes out of integration, in this case, happened to be the charge, so I call it charge with a symbol Q. And since you can measure voltage, and integrate, you can integrate that, you can flux. So these are the four fundamental variables that will define all elements in the universe of circuit theory. So if you have a device, two terminal device, where uh, no matter what you apply, voltage or current wave across the device, and you find that the current would always obey a fixed single-valued function relationship. And that's for any input, 
voltage, or conversely, any input current, you measure the voltage. And if that's the case, that element is called a resistor. Okay? That's, and that, that relation may be a straight line to the origin, and if that's so, that's Ohm's law. The, the slope is the resistance. If the input is voltage, then the slope is the conductance. So that's what a resistor is. It's simply a relationship between voltage and current, in general, nonlinear. Or the device may exhibit a relationship between the current and the flux. And in that case, that element is called an inductor. In the limiting case, where it's linear, a straight line, you recover the classical relationship. Or the device, in fact, may display a relationship between the voltage and charge. In that case, that element is called a capacitor. And when that relationship happens to be a straight line through the origin, it then re reduces to the classical definition of a capacitance. Now, if you take this way of defining circuit element axiomatically, then it's completely obvious that something is missing in this link. Unless the, my theory is wrong, there's got to be such an element. So therefore, to complete my theory, I had postulated in 1971 in the paper that I published when I was in MIT uh, then, uh, then the missing element had to be there even though it doesn't exist, just like the periodic table when it was first discovered by Mendeleev, there were a few gaps, and those gaps were eventually discovered. It's same, exactly the same situation here. And that element I call a memory store, which is a contraction for memory resistor for the reason that it actually, unlike the other three elements, it actually remembers the, 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 the resistance just before you pull the plug. You see, for the other three elements, if you pull the plug, you lost memory. And whereas this element, it actually remembers it. That's why this is an unusual element, because it, it has memory in that sense. OK, so now let me go on to uh, the, a, a quick explanation of what, why this uh, is Ohm's law. Well, if you imagine this, just as the, 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 this is a relationship between flux equal to charge. Let's say this is flux equal to Q cube, any nonlinearity. If this is a straight line, this would be a, resist, a linear resistor Ohm's law. And so let flux be some function of Q. If you differentiate both sides, the phi dt, remember, is just a derivative, of, is the integral of voltage phi or V is d phi dt, and by chain law is df dq dq dt, but dq dt is just current i by our definition, and this is just a slope at whatever point you are uh, observing. So therefore, this is completely equivalent to Ohm's law, with the only exception that the resistance is not a constant. The resistance depends on the charge that has been there since the time the device has been plugged with power in. OK, so that is uh, why this resistance is called memory resistance. Memory resistance. And <laughs> memory store, therefore, can be defined as a state-dependent Ohm's law. It's just Ohm's law, but the resistance depends on a state. And the state, by the way, can be one or more variables. What I just described is the most elementary dependence. Uh, you will see that. Now, it turns out that when, when I published a paper, uh, I had to build the, a, a device as a proof of principle that it actually can be built. But the device that I published to demonstrate uh, uh, this uh, actually made up of op amps and transistor, and I need a battery. So, so it, it, it actually take about the size of a shoes bag, which is totally uninteresting. But it's a, it's a, a prin, uh, proof of principle. And I didn't realize that uh, two, two years later, Josephson, who ha had a, received a Nobel Prize uh, then, uh, had previously, he, his, his Nobel Prize work was this circuit uh, called the Josephson Junction that was uh, built by Bell Lab very based on his theory and, and proved that it, it actually acts like what he said. And in this element, in this uh, three-circuit element, 
Joseph Sun actually had a, a symbol that he didn't know what it was, but he said that that is given by a relationship uh, be, between current and flux. It, is, it says a nonlinear function of flux. We not know today that that is an inductor, but it doesn't. Uh, it's okay. It's, it's the fact that he didn't know what it was doesn't reduce the importance of his work. But Joseph Sun, after getting the, uh, receiving a Nobel Prize in '73, uh, decided to go back to the fundamentals and realized suddenly that he had missed a tiny component that was not important enough that, that they, when Bella built this, uh, the circuit, it actually uh, was pretty good approximation. But to be correct, Joseph Sun said that there is one more component due to quantum mechanical quasi-particle current. And, and he didn't know what uh, that element was, but he, but he had an equation. So he didn't know what element. He said that that equation would obey the current uh, times the voltage, so it's, 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 it's conductance. But he said the conductance is not constant, it depends on the integral of the voltage. Well, we just not know that that is an, a membrane store. So in other words, uh, already in 73, there was a, a physical version of a membrane store, uh, but uh, th that was, of course, that's conceptual. It's, it's part of embedded in that, uh, that device. It's, it's just like uh, uh, a proton. They're made of quarks, but you can't take away the quark and say, this is my quark. So you can't re really say, even if I knew then, uh, I can't say that that had been found. It's just that conceptually, it, is, it actually existed in theory. So that is the first four element, the four elements that completed the Josephson Junction motor, and it turned out to be the four basic elements that I just you say. Now, it, fast forward 40 years or so, HP published a paper in Nature, and the title is uh, The Missing Membristor Farm, because the paper that I published is called Membristor, The Missing Circuit Element, since I really didn't have a real device without a battery that would do what I claim it should do. So Membristor uh, finally uh, uh, was known to the world uh, in, in 2008, about 40 years later. And uh, this is the, the, the picture that was given by Dr. Stanley Williams from Bell Lab, I mean, from HP, and show that the first Membristors uh, uh, picture, this is an array. Every one of them is Membristor. And all this is about uh, 17 nanometer. It's not so clear. Each one of them is about 17 nanometers. So it's very tiny. In, in contrast, Bell, I mean, SP shows that this is the largest known virus. And it's 25 nanometers. So the membrane that has been fabricated in 2008 by HP is already smaller than this, the smallest virus. Okay? And uh, now, why is this in mem has memory? The reason is, if you put in a voltage pulse, if this were a voltage current, a resistor, the voltage would just jump up there, and when you put a plug, it would go back to zero. But if, since this were a membristor, you put, you put in a voltage pulse, and you are, the, the, it's a flux that's the, that, that, that's the independent variable. So you integrate that, and after you put a plug, this doesn't go back to zero, it's at the remainder. So, so you start to integrate, and it will be there when you put a plug, and it stays there. So the slope stays there, the resistance stays there, and that's why it has the memory. The memory becomes the information, so wherever you are, you have a continuous range of resistance, and therefore you can navigate anywhere you want, and you will remember that forever until uh, you apply more uh, 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 voltages. Now this is uh, why it's called a non-volatile memory, and, and this is a, a not a big deal, big, huge industry, but this is not a purpose of my talk today, except to tell you that, that your uh, favorite frost tube is going to be sooner or later replaced by Membristor. Uh, so, so will uh, other things like the uh, DRAM and hard drive, they're all going to be replaced by Membristor in the future. But for today's purpose, the one of the fingerprint of a membristor, which is much easier to understand, is that if you plug in, put in a sine wave voltage, and measure the current, or vice versa, put in a current, sine wave current, and measure the voltage, and then plug that in the IV plane, 
if you have a memory, so you are going to get a hysteresis loop that always go through the origin. And it may intersect, do all kinds of strange things, but it had to go through the origin. And if you change the amplitude of the input sine wave or the frequency, you're going to get different, different hysteresis loop, but always it has to go through the origin. So experimentally, it is actually easier for the audience here to think of a memory loop as the, what I call an experimental definition. And that's, if it's pinch, it's a memory loop. That's really the best way to think of a memory loop, especially for today's talk. OK, now let me, I'm going to show you now uh, five examples, something that relates to biology uh, and, and why memory loop plays a crucial role here. Well, what you're seeing here is uh, a little animal that, that I will call it escargot, because that's what it is, but except that it lives in the water. And the, you will see that the escargot is wearing a Nobel Prize uh, medal here. And I copied this from a book uh, by Eric Kandel, who was the, uh, a Nobel Prize winner. And when he went to receive the medal, he had to give a talk, and the, that was the first slide that he showed. And he credited the, the, the escargot as responsible for his Nobel Prize, because it was through that uh, uh, escargot that he was able to derive the molecular basis of memory. Now, for those of you who didn't know about uh, what this escargot is, it has a, a tube-like object that's called a siphon, which is critical to this uh, organism, and, and because it needs to breathe, uh, to breathe the air. And so it is critical to the, the the, the life of this uh, animal, so that whenever it senses danger, it will immediately withdraw and, and hide. And they have to come out again to breathe again when, uh, after a few minutes. So Kandel had this uh, good sense of making an experiment. He would attach a sensor there, and he would gently touch it so that the sensor would generate an action potential uh, to tell this guy that something is danger could be dangerous. And then down there, there is an, he put another sensor which obviously need to generate a signal to, to, for the muscle to contract. So Kandel did this uh, several times, in fact, 15 times. Every time he did this, uh, this thing is withdrawn and then it come out again. And so the next slide will show, uh, he made 15 experiments, but he published only five of them from his book. I'm just copying. These are the five action potentials uh, out of the 15 experiments coded in different color from Kandel. And this is the, the second sensor to the muscle. And the first one has a big voltage to contract the muscle rapidly. And then the rest turn out, even though the action potential are all identical, but it gets this, the, 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 the signal to contract gets weaker and weaker. And that's because it takes a lot of energy to, to have such a big signal. So when the, uh, when the escal go realize that it's not life threatening, so he relaxed a bit. And so, so this is the most elementary form of learning. It's called habituation. And that's how Kandel uh, used this experiment to f understand what's going on, eventually leading to the Nobel Prize for the molecular basis. But today, all I want to show you is that, uh, is that there is a single memory. If you, I, I have found that you can have a single memory store right there, with this curve, this curve is, the slope keeps decreasing. Since it's this chart, we're looking at the, con the slope is the conductance. Conductance gets smaller and smaller. So if I apply 15 pulses to mimic the 15 identical action potential, then the output with by Ohm's law is just the conductance times that. Since this is constant, the, the, the current will be decreasing. So corresponding to the five, um, uh, contraction here, you will see the five uh, current waveform decreasing. It's doing exactly what the escargot is doing. So uh, what you're seeing here is the simplest example of learning where the neurotransmitter is being uh, modulated, in this case being decreased, which translates into the curve where this slope is being moved uh, smaller and sm smaller so, th so that it, it gets less and less uh, uh, in strength. So, so I've just shown you that the synaptic strength, in fact, is exactly memory size. This, this is an accurate description of that. 
And knowing that, you can say that synapses are memory stores. That's the first important take-home lesson today. Synapses, your synapses, imagine they're all memory stores, okay? Now, a, sim a related experiment uh, is called the long-term potentiation, or LTP, that I'm sure many of you already have heard before. It was first discovered in 1973 by uh, Bliss and, and uh, Lomo, and they published a paper, in fact, uh, in 1973, two years after my paper. So already there was a memory store, although they didn't know it. An experiment is very simple. The, the phenomena they discovered by uh, Bliss and Lomo is, what they did is they uh, have a hypo, hippocampus, they apply this a voltage pulse, and measure and output a, a pulse somewhere else down, down the hippocampus, and further it has a small uh, response. So for that, say A, amplitude A, you get about, say, one half, just for illustration. But then they had the good sense of uh, doing the following uh, experiment. So instead of repeating that experiment, they actually turned to a pulse generator, say, it's like putting 20 pulses like that, and then repeat that experiment. So put it back there. Now normally, well, if you switch, this is gone, you forget it. But they were so surprised that when, after this priming, they put it back in, they suddenly made sure a different, a much bigger output. That phenomenon has since been called long-term potentiation, and it is an elementary example, in fact, of Hebbian learning. So now I want to show you that you can do exactly the same thing, where we're not going through the details in the, in the interest of time. If you pick a memory of this two curve, you will get exactly the same behavior for the same input. The first output without a priming, you get that. With the priming, you will get the other one. So I've just shown you that another trivial memory store would reproduce a classic experiment that remains to be a very important uh, subject of study today. And uh, now I want to come to this real event that triggers, uh, this, I told you there was a crisis. This was the, the, the famous Nobel Prize paper by Haskin Eckley that I'm sure most of you knew. And this was a, the, the circuit that gave them the Nobel Prize. And this circuit consists, this is the, the axon. They were looking at a jelly uh, squid, and they were measuring the axon and find how the axon potential came from. See, it's, physiology has struggled for more than 50 years. And to, to show how you can generate action potential from zero to something like 100 millivolt. And no one can do that until Haskin Huxley came around 50, 60 years later and showed that they have a circuit that will do that. And this circuit consists of three, three batteries, one capacitor, one resistor, and two other resistors, one they call that this from, uh, mod, uh, mod mimics uh, potassium ion channel. This mimics a sodium ion channel. And the, the interesting thing is that unlike this resistor where they can say this is say 50, 50 million, I mean Siemens, but they say they can't tell you uh, what the conductance of these two elements is. They say they are resistors, and they have ohms as a unit, but it changes with time. And, but they did have empirical equation, and you put the empirical equation in the computer, it actually gives you the correct answer. That was a major event. And this circuit model remains a, a classic model widely used today. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with this experiment, uh, with this model, and they absolutely deserve the Nobel Prize. By the way, this is the, uh, the, the, the potassium ion channel, and this is the sodium ion channel. And that, that, the first resistor is called the potassium. They call it the time-varying potassium current. And this, uh, they call time-varying sodium current resistor, okay? All right, now the problem that uh, led to this is that uh, when they take small signal measurement, they found that the axon uh, the, from the squid axon actually had a very big inductance. We're talking about something like one Henry, uh, two Henry, and uh, both Haskin and Huxley were, were shocked. So were his uh, co colleagues, including Kenneth Cole, that many uh, people, especially from USA, felt that he should share the Nobel Prize with Haskin and Huxley, because they made use of a critical instrument that he designed to, to get their result. Anyway, uh, he didn't get the Nobel Prize, but he wrote a book 
to account for the history of this situation. And he said, I'm just quoting it from this book. He said, the suggestion of an inductive reactance anywhere in the system, he means the brain, was shocking to the point of being unbelievable, okay? And, and, and it's clear for those of you who didn't know what a one-hand inductor, I'm carrying a one-hand inductor. And the measurement say that your brain should be full of that kind of a thing. There will be very strong magnetic field, and of course, that's all nonsense. And there has been a paradox unsolved until the memory still comes around. And uh, so the Huskins blunder was that uh, they, 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 they struggled in vain, searching for the physical interpretation of the squid action inductance. They fell, or he, uh, Haskin in particular, because he had mistaken action for the time vein conductance, when in fact it is a simple explanation if the potassium and sodium channel are identified as memory restores. So the, the, sim, the correct interpretation of this term is that they are not time varying elements at all. They are, in fact, not a reserve, they are memory restores. This is the potassium memory store, the sodium memory store, and every, everything it's completely clear why you would measure something like one Henry uh, inductance. Okay, let me, uh, th this is a sample of the pinhysteresis look measured from uh, the potassium sodium inductor. So I've just shown you that axons are in fact made of memory stores. And if axons are memory and, and, and synapses are made by memory stores, from information processing perspective, brains are made of memory stores. And now I'm gonna show you a few more examples that would show you that why memory store is, is really a critical component. Uh, we go back earlier, 1904, Pablo, uh, with his uh, famous experiment, uh, Pablo was trying to understand whether, how the dog would behave with two different stimulus. First, he, he put, he'd ring a bell, the sound, and the dog uh, is, is indifferent, totally uninterested. But when, he, she, she, uh, when Pablo showed a piece of meat, he salivates, and, the, and that's explainable because the saliva contains the enzyme that the dog needs to digest the meat. So that's not so interesting, but Pablo had the good sense of then uh, perform the experiment. So he would show the dog with the, the steak first, whereupon the dog start, began salivating, and then he would ring the bell almost immediately afterward. He did this maybe two, three times, and then wait maybe five, five ten minutes, and then come back and then ring the bell, and the dog salivates. So that's the classic experiment that led to the Nobel Prize. For the first time, he was able to show that the dog can associate two different kinds of stimulus, okay? And now, uh, uh, two years ago, a, a, a group in, from Wuhan, China, published a paper. Uh, by the way, I, uh, my name was there, but I have no contribution other than to confirmed that, that they, in fact, have a memory store. So what they did, they actually built a device, a memory store. This is a real device, so this is not a simulation. They connect this into a, with two resistors, and then two signal generators. One the, the, will be the dog. When you have a signal, that, that means that there's a stick. And, it's, and when the first one will be when they sound. And then they will take the measurement here, okay? So from this real circuit, uh, so this is not a simulation, it's a real experiment. Uh, you see that when only the food is present, the signal, uh, there's an output. That's when the dog salivates, when there's no, no, no sound. But when there is sound input, but no, no food, there is no, no output as expected. Then he put in one, uh, Professor Miao's group, put in a, a, a pulse indicating sound and the pulse indicating foot, and indeed get an output as you would expect. Then he followed it with only the sound, then without any foot, and there is an output. So that is a perfect simulation of uh, the Pablo experiment. So the last example that I would like uh, to show is uh, amoeba, uh, because uh, this Amoeba among, doesn't have a brain, no neuron, nothing, but it has microtubules, and that's where uh, Jack is going to continue on. But I'll tell you an interesting experiment. Uh, amoeba, most of you probably know, crawl, but very slow, about one centimeter per hour at room temperature, like 26 degrees. And 
I mean, but that's not a brain. But you see, in this experiment, that there is a, they have a mind. Well, it turns out that the amoeba likes to crawl only when it's in room temperature about 26 degrees. If you suddenly lower the temperature by so much as 3 degrees, it's just like someone will young you, put you in the North Pole, and, and what you would do is, of course, you would freeze. You wouldn't move, right? That's exactly what happened to amoeba. So this experiment by a Japanese science group of scientists uh, shows a, a, a one-dimensional conduit so that the amoeba would be forced to move in one direction. And there were the camera to record what's going, what the movement. And then these are the tubes that, to control the temperature. So at, at, at 26 degrees, the amoeba will be moving uh, so they, they can monitor the speed. And when you drop by 3 degrees to 23, um, the, 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 the amoeba will stop moving. So this is the experiment. Uh, over, uh, this is 60 minutes, OK? So when, when there's a, a 26 degree, the amoeba are moving. Not constant, but it moves. And zero is when they stop moving are there. So at one hour, at two hours later, the, this, this uh, Japanese scientist would put in, drop to by three, by three degree, it suddenly the amoeba stopped moving. And even though after, then because uh, we draw back, they are back to 26, but amoeba eventually will recover and start moving again. So one hour later, uh, the scientists put in another three degree drop, and the amoeba stopped moving, and it recovered, and, and the third, third hour, repeat the same thing, the amoeba stopped working, moving again. Now, interesting thing is, if I show you only two pulses, you wouldn't know that that the, the signal is periodic. You need to have three to know that it's periodic, and then you can then tell that this period, and then you can tell, calculate the period. Well, it turned out that amoeba actually can do that. Why? Because after, after what here, the scientists didn't put any pulse here. One hour later, the, the temperature there, the room temperature, but amoeba started moving, it's, you know. It had calculated that in one hour, you know, it's going to be cold. So that's, that's incredible, you know. The amoeba can do that. And then, then they, 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 they recover until oh, a few hours later, they send to put another pulse, and maybe I start moving. And then the next hour, the, even though there's no pulse, the amoeba start, stop again, anticipating that that's going to happen. Well, this is quite amazing. And uh, without going to take a lot of time, this, uh, what, what I've just shown you is that amoeba can learn and adapt. In the sense that when stimulated by pattern periodic environmental changes, amoeba learns and changes its behavior in anticipation of the next stimulus to come. And this has been shown by Professor Deventra uh, that uh, this circuit with a single membrane will actually reproduce exactly the phenomena. I don't have time to go through that, but believe me, we do the same thing. So can uh, our amoeba intelligence, they don't even have, have, have neurons, uh, OK, so certainly no, no brain. Well, it turned out that uh, you can answer this question by just going back to the dawn of civilization. Go back to Nile in Egypt, 6,000 years ago. Okay, and uh, it turned out that uh, you might not realize that discerning periodicity is not actually easy, not even for humans. Why? Because when the ancient Egyptians, remember 6,000 years ago, recognized that a regular periodicity of flooding of the river Nile and succeeded in anticipating the next blood flood. See, before that, they were, they were just inundated, but eventually the primitive people in Egypt realized that it's periodic, OK? And, and, and that's not trivial, just to, to, to realize it's periodic. It took many, many years, hundreds of years, until some clever Egyptian realized it's a periodic phenomenon, and, and from that insight succeeded in anticipating the next flood. Well, this breakthrough, believe it or not, triggered an invention of the calendar and was the symbol of the dawn of civilization. So it's not trivial to detect that no, something's periodic. Well, I want to end my talk with tell you that memory stores are, in fact, ubiquitous. These are the four examples, five examples, that have to do with biology in the brain, OK? But uh, I will show you a quick example. Uh, this has been all published, not by me, but by other people. Even egg white, you can make, uh, make measurement and you show that it's memory stores. And, uh, this is something you can perform. Uh, a group at the University of Oslo published a paper a uh, few years ago. It showed that if you put two electrodes to your arm and take measurement, 
you get a pinch hysteresis loop. So their membrisor, our body, in fact, is covered with membrisor, which is quite shocking. Uh, now, uh, the next interesting, ex uh, last example virtually is uh, the venous fry trap. As most of you probably know, the venous fry trap is one of those things that really has intelligence because when a uh, insect would uh, uh, go in, uh, sort of touch that, it would suddenly clump in there. But the interesting thing is that the, the venous fry trap would not just close on uh, the, the insect. Uh, if the insect would just touch that, there are three fibers on top and a three fiber at the bottom. If it touches only one, nothing will happen. It has to touch two at the same time before you do it. So it actually can calculate and it's, it's actually it's quite intelligent. And this uh, has been f found uh, by a group uh, <coughs> from USA uh, in, in, in Tennessee uh, and proved that they, that they, that they it exhibits the pinch hysteresis loop. So, so you can say that the venous fry trap, in fact, are memory restores. But more interestingly, a paper published in 2011 uh, because before then, nobody known, by the way, that, that the, the memory store is actually uh, uh, can generate action potentials. That, and of interest here is the author here that made this paper particularly interesting, and that's in Nehir. Most of you probably uh, may, may know Erwin Nehir uh, uh, received the Nobel Prize by showing, uh, by understanding the single iron channel in cells. And he was one of the uh, key authors in this particular uh, paper. And uh, they were able to demonstrate that the, when this happened, when, when, it, when the venous fry would close up, it actually generates uh, calcium ion channels and memory stores. Uh, in other words, action potential generated by, by calcium ion channels are, in fact, uh, from memory stores. And so, in fact, the potassium ion channel as well as a sodium ion channel, and now we have the calcium ion channel, and there's chloride ion channel. In fact, they, all ion channels are memory, so I've just verified that. And uh, so, so we, we, there's a saying, of course, where there is smoke, there is fire. Well, you can say that where there is ion, there is memory store. Okay, that's for sure. Okay, so the final few slides, is just to show there, it's ubiquitous. Put in a elect couple electrodes to a bipole, you have a pinch history loop. So upwards are memory stores in some sense. So the last picture I show you is a sun passion flower. Uh, if you touch a, uh, a <laughs> if you attach, attach uh, a electrode, oh, sorry. Um, I have to go back to this uh, sunflower because uh, Get a little bit out of order. Okay, this is the flower that you've just seen. And there's a couple of electrodes there. And if you apply the usual thing, the signal, you'll find that it's a pinch history, it's this loop. So I, I close my talk uh, by uh, going forwards so that uh, uh, Jack will come out and show you that, uh, in fact, uh, microtubules are also memory stores in the sense that. It, act, it actually display uh, a, a pinch hysteresis loop. Uh, this is the measurement that uh, Jack is going to be uh, explaining, which proved experimentally uh, that microtubules are in fact membrane stores. And I want to mention, uh, by the way, that uh, the picture I, that he will most likely show you is a is, is a is a microtuber, but, but that, these are made of made of compo a, a, a lot of uh, elementary components that he's going to explain. And each one of them are in fact mem restores. But I prove a theorem which says that if you have a mem restore or any number of them, you interconnect them any way you want. In this case, say a cylinder, and you stick two wires. If those are all mem restores. You, the whole thing is putting this into a black box, you have another memory store. So in that sense, Jack is going to show that uh, microtuber memory store. Thank you.
Thank you. All right, maybe one quick question while Jack sets up. We're anybody? Daniel. Um, has uh, the mem <clears throat> excuse me? Has the memristor been translated into the quantum realm such that it might dovetail with with the uh, Penrose Hammeroff quantum? Uh, well, uh, no. And the answer is no, and that's. Uh, not because it's not, uh, it's just that people didn't know about it yet. And, and uh, that I'm, I'm sure that, that uh, time uh, will come when people start delve into the physics and there will be quantum me mechanical aspects of it. But I'm not an expert in that area. I couldn't say any more. Okay. All right, let's thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is another good friend of mine, uh, Professor Jack Tusinski, University of Alberta. Um, it's not that I only invite my friends, by the way. Uh, I just have a lot of friends. Um, <clears throat> who will speak on microtubules as subcellular memristors. Jack. Thank you, Stuart. <laughs> so it's great to be here. Um, I guess my, my punchline has been stolen, but <laughs> we'll get to it. Um, so, uh, but I'll take it back. First of all, uh, this is uh, based on uh, the work of many people, and they are listed here, some of my summer students and graduate students and collaborators. Uh, the experimental part was uh, carried out in collaboration with Professor Shankar in electrical engineering, and we used uh, some of the latest nanotechnology tools to get to the bottom of this issue. I've been interested in electrical properties, electrostatic properties, electromagnetic properties of biological systems mainly microtubules for the past 10 years. And in the last year, I think we've made some major advances in this, uh, in this area. Um, by the way, this study was funded uh, by Novocure, uh, a, a company from Israel that uh, uses electromagnetic stimulation for cancer treatment. And so uh, this is my main interest, but somehow we got into the memristor aspect, which has to do with neuroscience, not cancer research. Uh, I'll show it to you later. And I want to acknowledge my collaborators on this, Chris Carlson from Harvard and so Socrates Dokus from Australia, Her Horacio Cantillo from Harvard, now at Buenos Aires, and Avner Priel at bar -Ilan. And a shameless plaque for three books related to this conference, although th this topic, this uh, talk today will be a bit more technical, but extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. So I'll, I'll try to give you some very detailed uh, account of what we've done, and this, this is a paper that is now in second review at Scientific Reports, hopefully published soon. So uh, in the, um, one of the pre-conference workshops, I talk about memory, and th this actually will look back to memory um, later on, molecular memory, uh, memory storage concepts, various ideas around holographic, fractal memories, some claim are not even stored in the brain. Um, there are, of course, collective memories uh, in insects, worms, caterpillars, slime mold. Society has a memory, historical and otherwise. And something which kind of <clears throat> throws a monkey wrench into this whole idea of brains having memories, the, the work of Michael Levin at Tufts University in Boston, who uh, decapitated worms that were trained to solve some mazes, and, and they, after regrowing the, the, the the heads with their brains still remembered how to solve it. So there is something about uh, memories being not only stored in the brain, but we'll talk today about the brain and the neurons. And neurons, of course, you'll find microtubules. So this is along the lines of Stuart Hameroff's the last how many years? Four decades, I guess, of, of your work. More? I forgot. I forgot. <laughs> So, so what is memory? Well, memory is uh, commonly defined as the ability to encode, store, and recall information. And um, in terms of the brain, uh, definitely um, memory is uh, involved in, uh, and believed to be involved in, networks of synaptic connections in the brain between neurons. Uh, but we believe it's deeper than that, um, not, not, ex not excluding the, the synaptic uh, uh, concepts. 
And long-term potentiation, which um, Leon mentioned, uh, is a um, hallmark of memory uh, building. Now, but the question is, what, what is the molecular level of memory, uh, and where is the substrate, material substrate for memory storage inside neurons, if there is such a thing? So we, we uh, focus on the neuron then, and that's a often copied slide from Stuart Hammer. Um, I, I think it was first published in your book, right? A long time ago. Still, still valid, and we have microtubules uh, inside the neuron, axons as well as dendrites, um, uh, illustrated here by thick lines, interconnected by maps. Um, Nancy Wolf talked about how this may lead to neurodegenerative diseases, impairment of microtubules, cytoskeleton, traffic in microtubules. There is a huge area of investigation around this. Um, uh, a few years ago, now five years ago, we uh, published a, a paper on uh, a memory code which involves um, cal calmodulin kinase enzyme phosphorylating microtubules based on experiments done previously by uh, a group at Johns Hopkins, I believe. And um, this brings microtubules into the uh, picture, and specifically, which is important in this context, c terminal of microtubules, because these enzymes, which are also motors, by the way, they phosphorylate serine um, residues on c termini It's very important. c termini are the most flexible um, parts of microtubules. They are polypeptide chains that stick out and basically act like antennas, and they interact with the environment. Uh, in fact, all motor protein involves c termini um, so they play a very important role. If c termini can be cleaved, uh, microtubules, first of all, um, will not participate in the tra motor traffic, and secondly, they will not be stable. So there is something very important about that. Um, we'll come back to it later. Uh, and, and that's an example of how one could encode uh, bits of information into a, ma into a microtubule in neurons. And uh, this paper uh, illust illustrates in detail how this uh, leads to various consequences at the level of, uh, of the whole uh, neuron and, and the brain, uh, one of which is the ability, in fact, to uh, encode the entire lifetime of memories into all microtubules in the brain. That's within the realm of possibilities. We heard this morning some very interesting ideas about near, uh, near-death experiences and, and the burst of uh, EEG activity. Uh, this might also be in, in some way in, involved in it, but that's not the topic of my talk, so I'll move on. Um, and so electric, uh, f electric field effects on microtubules have been recognized and, and tested in the past, especially um, AC electric fields, because um, DC fields are actually screened very strongly. So there is something to be said about um, frequency modulation. And, and you will see t t today in my, uh, the rest of my talk how, how this figures in, in, the, um, in, in this uh, concept. Um, so there are some very interesting similarities between microtubule um, mm, arrangements, geometry of microtubule bundles in electric fields and, and the field lines themselves. And at some frequencies, they actually organize themselves almost like two opposite pole magnetic, uh, sorry, magnets or, or dipole moments, as you can see in the green. Uh, so this is a mitotic spindle arrangement overlaid with the lines of the dipole moment. It's amazing how accurately it is. Um, reproduced. These were experiments done about uh, nine years ago uh, by a group from Michigan showing very strong effects of um, AC electric fields depending on the frequency different organization of microtubules in the lab were uh, reported. Uh, and there are, the complication is that there are several uh, mm, simultaneous effects. Dielectrophoresis, which is dipole moment or, uh, arrangements in um, field gradients, electroosmotic flows, and thermal conduction. All three uh, play a role with different contributions at different frequencies. So, so one has to be very careful. It's not a very simple system. Microtubules actually are very complicated, and they have many possible channels of uh, physical interactions. Uh, so, so let's now zoom in, and, and I'll get into the experiments in a second. We've done some um, theoretical computational work on microtubules, reconstructed their uh, structure. Um, in silico, uh, I also participate in some experiments in Germany on m microtubule migration and electric fields uh, with um, the group of um, 
Eberhard Unger, which was published, they were directed by electric fields. So, so there is ample evidence that they do respond to electric fields. And now the next group of experiments, and this is still computational. Um, uh, first of all, the, the diagram on the left illustrates charge distribution on microtubules. Red is negative, so they are very heavily negatively charged. C termini, which are not illustrated, are actually carrying about 40% of all the charge. So that's another important aspect about C termini. Most, not most, but almost half of the charge of microtubules resides on the external antennas. Um, the, uh, there is, of course, counter ions in solution, which screen a lot of these charges, but not completely. And that leads, lead, leads to um, dielectric polarization, which is illustrated on the right. Um, and there are many possible ionic effects, ionic conduction effects involving microtubules. First of all, there could be simple in, um, impedance to flow uh, because the microtubules are bulky. By the way, 25 nanometer diameter is exactly the same range that Leon mentioned, the memristors uh, by Hewlett Packard and the viruses. It's, it's the same sort of si size uh, uh, scale. Uh, first, secondly, microtubules attract and accelerate ions. Thirdly, they can condense them. Some of the ions will be condensed, not very movable. And, the far, uh, and fourthly, uh, as I mentioned, C-termini can be used for ion fluxes. We've done simulations uh, for ionic conductivity. Um, for actin filaments and microtubules, there are different roles. Actin filaments uh, conduct uh, elec electric uh, impulses with no loss, so solitonic-like. This was published in the lab of Horatio Cantiello at Harvard. And then we moved on to microtubules, which were shown to amplify, and not only uh, conduct losslessly, but amplify electric signals, which is quite amazing. Nonlinearity, first example of nonlinearity when you amplify things. Uh, and this is kind of an artist's rendition of how ions can flow uh, around microtubules. So they are, I would call them biowires microtubules, and you'll see uh, measurements in a few minutes that show exactly how incredibly conducting they are. Um, we'll come to the, the, the area of influence uh, is, is not that big, about one nanometer, 0.7 nanometer to one nanometer, depending on um, pH and things like that. Uh, we, we wrote a review paper on conductivity in the cytoskeleton. Uh, ionic and protonic is, is demonstrated. Electronic is suspected. Nobody has demonstrated that electronic conductivity, per se, through the filament takes place, but it's quite possible. Um, this is a summary of conductivity data. I just want you to look at the last column, which, which are the values from about, about 10 different experiments, different groups around the world, including Anurban sitting in the back in Japan, groups in the US, groups in Germany. Um, other groups in, um, in the US. And the, the values of conductivity in Siemens per meter uh, vary a lot. So, so there's something to be said about the precision of experiments that need to be exercised in order to get to the bottom of these. They vary by seven orders of magnitude, which is quite amazing um, in its own right. So this is the experiment on transistor-like amplification that was published um, about 10 years ago. Uh, and it shows you how amplification of the signal is done compared to solution and also between the stimulus and the collection electrode. So the signal flows along the microtubule um, as a pulse and gets amplified. We speculate it's because of the polarization, electric polarization of microtubules, not just biological polarization, but electric. Okay, and we built a, a theory involving um, circuit elements and uh, translating this into a cable e equation, nonlinear cable, where uh, I haven't lost track of the story. Actually, we'll come to Leon Chua in a second. <laughs> uh, so this, this is the, the, the uh, sort of turning point in all of this, because a group from Israel did um, measurements of responses of cancer cells to AC electric fields, and they found a, a range of frequencies of from 100 to 200 kilohertz at which cancer cells basically stop dividing. And, and that was an incredible, um, incredibly interesting observation which led to the formation of the company. And now actually it's in clinic. In the clinic they passed uh, um, FDA approval and 
phase three clinical trials from, for glioblastoma, and they, uh, the results are astounding. They, uh, they are able to extend the life of brain cancer patients from 12 to 24 months, so uh, just by applying electrodes to the brain. Uh, and they've done experiments in vitro and vivo. In vitro experiments demonstrate uh, the um, responses of microtubules. That's why I'm showing this slide. And, uh, and that led to this <coughs> contract we received to look at microtubules in these types of electric fields. And now we're going to show you what happened last year when we fabricated, using nanofabrication, we created um, microfluidic devices with electrodes etched in the substrate. Um, uh, like so, um, platinum electrodes uh, and a flow cell in, into which we delivered buffer solution with either tubulin or microtubules. We are now working on actin filaments as well. And uh, we are able to perform very precise measurements of conductivities and capacitance uh, for these systems of microtubules or unassembled tubulin. This is the device for characterization, Keithley semiconductor characterization system. Um, and, and that's a, um, a visualization of, of the setup. You're looking at microtubules um, shown in white streaks. Uh, straight lines are electrodes, and microtubules sometimes make contact with these electrons, sometimes they don't. But overall, in a given system, we have about 50,000 microtubules in one measurement. And we can extrapolate from that and calculate uh, c conductances that you will see in a second. Um, so these are four probe and two probe IV measurements. Uh, that's another. So we very carefully polymerize microtubules, stabilize them with taxol, or stabilize tubulin with colchicine to prevent polymerization. About 90% of all tubulin is polymerized into microtubules when you want microtubules to be formed. If you don't, then none of the microtubules are there. And we can compare. And this is actually leading to something very important, I think, apart from the membrister, which will also be very important. But the most important thing is that when you look at dividing cells, they switch from depolymerized tubulin to polymerized tubulin in the form of microtubules. This is a physical phase transition, not just a biological transition from, let's say, a spherical cell to to a bifurcating dividing cell, but it's a transition from a resistive to a conductive medium. Uh, you will see. OK, so that's the experimental protocol. We do it very carefully. Uh, we flash them each time for the, uh, with uh, ionic, ionic strength buffer, do three, at least three conductance frequency sweeps, flash again, do conductance sweeps with the uh, microtubules or Tubulin, we looked at different concentrations of tubulin and microtubules, three different concentrations. We call them 1x, 2x, and 5x. 1x is 40, 42 nanomolar concentration. Um, OK, that's, that's another look at this setup. And the electric field uh, simulation around the electrodes, with the pair of electrodes in a V-shape, chevron type, in between these is a 14 micrometer gap. And you have electric field concentration there. Um, so it's 14 microns. I think it's one volt across. On this order, we can also sweep it. Okay, and now we are going to. I'll flood you with results <laughs> uh, of these measurements. So this is the first conductance of micro, for microtubules um, as a function of frequency. The frequency range is from one kilohertz to one megahertz, and you'll see the peak around 100 kilohertz, which is the frequency that Novacure uses for treating cancer. And at this frequency, microtubules have the highest conductivity. Uh, we'll come to, to individual microtubule conductivity in a second. I want to mention that uh, microtubules themselves constitute something like 0.1% of the um, charges in solution compared to the ions flowing around. So it's a tiny uh, contribution in terms of electrostatics, but in incredibly important contribution to the change in conductivity or conductance of the entire sample. Uh, on the order of 20%. So something which is 0.1% makes a difference of 20%. Uh, that, that's an incredible amplifying effect. Um, so what, is, what you have here is the green is the, the highest concentration of microtubules, 5x. Then below is 2x microtubules, then there is 1x. And then you have the buffer solution at the bottom. 
Um, this is percentage increase, the same plotted differently, just to show you how up to 25% increase in conductivity of the entire sample due to this 0.1% of microtubules in the sample. Um, this is conductance for tubulin. Unassembled microtubules is the opposite. Tubulin, so, uh, so green is the buffer and blue is tubulin. So when you have unassembled microtubules, the solution is less conductive than if there was nothing in it. For microtubules, remember, up to 25% increase in conductance. So the whole sample becomes much more conducting. Um, this is, again, a difference between microtubules and in, in red conductance of microtubules and red conductance of tubulin, the same number of units, once assembled, one, once disassembled. So when you assemble tubulin to microtubules, you increase conductance by 50% uh, or more. So it's a, really this transition from resistive to conductive material. Uh, and that happens in, in, uh, in vitro. It'll, it'll happen in vivo as well. OK, let's move on. Uh, this shows, again, the same thing. Although with higher frequency, this dimish, diminishes. So there's a window peak frequency sensitivity at about 100 to 200 kilohertz. Um, Capacitance. So now capacitance, we also measured, is probably less important, but uh, it's um, microtubules also have uh, higher capacitance than the buffer, um, and their, they, their capacitance uh, decreases with frequency, uh, which can be explained because capacitance means uh, aggregation of counter ions around the surface, and when you increase the frequency, you f free up the ions. They are not so bound by, uh, by this surface of microtubules. Um, I'll just, okay, so, so this is the summary of these experiments on conductance and capacitance. Microtubules increase solution conductance compared to the buffer. Tubulin decreases conductance compared to the buffer. As microtubule concentration increases, conductance increases linearly. Um, the largest difference between microtubule conductance and buffer conductance is around 100 kilohertz. We have a precise number you'll see in a second. And for capacitance, Capacitance increases for microtubules in solution. Tubulin decreases capacitance. And again, concentration of microtubules uh, affects conductance and capacitance um, linearly. OK, this is some quantitative numbers for you to take home. We have approximately assembled 90% of tubulin to microtubules with about 50,000 microtubules in the field uh, volume of between the electro in the entire sample between electrodes. Um, we estimated, uh, based on the numbers I gave you from the plots, that capacitors have about uh, 3 nanofarad capacitance per microtubule. And conductance, and this is an important number, conductance of a single microtubule, 10 micrometer long. We have also data on the distribution of sizes. I, I don't have time to go into this. But on average, it's about 10 to 15 micron long microtubules. It's 20 Siemens per meter. If you remember the table, it's not quite in the middle, but uh, maybe closer to the lower estimate. The lowest was 0.3, I think. This is about um, 100 times greater than the lowest estimate. Um, but the buffer has a 10 millisecond, milli Siemens per meter conductance, which is about 2,000 times less. So you can see these microtubules as highly conductive wires, biological wires, with a conductivity 2,000 times greater than the surrounding solution. OK. There are consequences for making mi uh, microtubule networks. You can make them into networks, interconnect by maps, and do bioelectronics. This is not part of this uh, crowd, I guess, not into technology so much. But you can think about the brain processing information being a bioelectronic bio network. And if you have damage to the, these networks, and Nancy Wolf talked about the various uh, uh, types of damage and neurodegenerative diseases, traumatic brain injury, you break these networks, and you've, you impede the conductance within the neuron. Uh, so, so that may have incredible repercussions if you um, analyze it in, in, in detail. Um, this is a f uh, fit into the curve for, con for conductance as a function of frequency. We did Gaussian, Lorentzian, and Voigt functions, all of which give pretty good um, R squared, close to 95%. Uh, for Gaussian, it's 97.7. For Voigt, actually, 99.2. The combination, Voigt is a combination of Lorentzian and, and Gaussian. So it's a very good fit. And, and that shows you that, first of all, the, the 
peak frequency is constant. It doesn't depend on, on concentration. It's about 105 kilohertz at which the peak conductivity of microtubules occurs. Um, the width uh, changes uh, other parameters a little bit, but they're, they're not very sensitive. OK, now we're coming to the memory store. So I hope I convinced you that microtubules have conductive properties and very unusual at this. Um, we did something else, and we are still completing the results. What I showed you so far, it took a year. Now we need another six weeks to complete the, um, the second part of the project, which is to analyze memristor properties, and I'll show you. So Leon explained to you that the memristor is a, a fourth element of electrical circuits. One thing I want to uh, maybe emphasize for this audience that there's one thing that is, in my opinion, critical for me memristors, not only a pinched hysteresis loop, which is actually a consequence of bistability. The system has to be bistable. They, they, it has to be two states, the conductive states, that, between which the system can oscillate. And microtubules have that. And that's the reason why I believe microtubules are memristors uh, based on the fundamental understanding of what they do. Uh, the second thing is frequency dependence. These hysteresis loops depend on frequency. At low, uh, zero frequency, there is no hysteresis. At high frequency, there is no hysteresis. In between, there is. We've done measurements at one kilohertz. And you saw this, so I'll just move on. First of all, we did simulations of microtubules as, as um, um, cable, using cable equations with C termini simulated as uh, random oscillators decorating the whole surface. And this is where Leon steps in, because he read the paper, and he contacted me and said, uh, you don't understand, but, but you discovered that microtubules are memristors. <laughs> and I didn't understand it. <laughs> um, Basically, we found that the IV characteristic from simulations is indicative of a nonlinear response. We didn't go back and forth, so there's no loop. But Leon, with his, uh, sorry, with his collaborator, I'm just jumping in, uh, reconstruct, a Russian scientist, Pitnev, reconstructed these um, uh, computational experiments we did and created um, a proper hysteresis loop prediction. OK, so that's interesting. And and I kind of explain this because of you have to understand a little bit more about microtubules beyond what I explained already. Uh, microtubules are not only cylindrical, charged on the surface. There is actually a potential difference between the outside and the inside, about 100 milli millivolts, com which is comparable, actually, to membrane potentials. And on top of that, there are nanopores. About four, every four nanometers, there is an, a hole one nanometer in diameter that allows I sorry, ions to flow in and out. So it's a very dynamic. On top of that, you have C termini, which are dynamically oscillating. And that creates this incredibly intricate electrical system, which led, so this shows you the C termini negatively charged. They can attract and repel ions depending on their electrostatic charge. So this was all simulated um, with this kind of setup where you have um, a layer of cylindrical arrangement of, of these elements with the uh, uh, oscillating C termini, and, and we got this plot. Leon and Spitnev translated the plot into um, hysteresis loops, and we did the experiments. So finally, we have this. This is a bit more detailed than, than what you saw at the end of Leon's talk. This shows you that not only, um, so, so this is one kilohertz oscillation, AC current, sorry, AC voltage, a bias current which sweeps in and out, so you, you actually go back and forth. And it shows you that both tubulin, if tubulin is unpolymerized, it is also memoristic. When it's poly poly polymerized into microtubules, it's also memoristic with a slightly different value uh, of memoristance. But both tubule and microtubules have C termini. So, so this, this is due to these dynamics of oscillating C termini. This shows you what Leon uh, showed, basically. Um, microtubules in buffer, and then extract on the right, extracted microtubule alone co uh, contribution, which is like, like a classic pinched hysteresis loop uh, that Leon was um, talking about. And now, my final comments about not my phone. <laughs> uh, 
my final comments about how I see it. Mm. So in one of the review papers on memristors, they compare it to, um, to a pipe through which a fluid flows. It's a pipe whose diameter changes. So the, the, the rate of flow changes depending on the diameter of the pipe, whether it goes in or out. OK, so that's an analogy for, for fluid dynamic, from fluid dynamics. And this is your pipe, a microtubule with C-termini that can extend out or in depending on the flow of current. So it's highly negative. If you bring less positive charge, they will compress. If it's more positive, they will spread out. So depending on the flow, this is a dynamical system. Uh, and by the way, my C-termini -termin have also two states. I, I didn't show it, but they have one stable state is exactly out, like here. Another is to bind to the surface. There's a little positive char uh, charge on the uh, surface of microtubules, and they oscillate between these two states. So I try to explain to you that bi stability is important. This is um, my interpretation. We haven't um, published it yet, so you are the first audience to see it. And finally, I want to connect it all to, to the brain's memory code. So far, it's all biophysics, you know, kind of hard-nosed science. Now we go back to this idea that Stuart and Travis Craddock and, and I had that there is a phosphorylation code, which, by the way, involves C-termini. Now, remember, C-termini are, are, are completely are, um, cardinal in um, the memoristic aspect of conductivity. So th you can now look back and connect the, the, the um, phosphorylation of C-termini, which is what calmodulin kinase does, with the dynamics of ionic flows. And, and all of this can be passed on, the, the information about the state of microtubules into the ion channels and up scale beyond the neuron. So that's the scale up aspect, bottom up uh, connection. And, um, and I think that's um, very compelling. Uh, I, in the beginning, told you memory has to have a readout and, and, and a write. Uh, and so the writing the code might be uh, exactly this way by calvagenal kinase. Readout could be by ionic flows, and, and they will be different depending on how phosphorylated the C-termini are. And finally, this is very much work in progress. Um, so we showed that there is a pinched hysteresis loop at one frequency. We want to do it at different frequencies, find out at what frequency it will stop, because we know it should. Uh, at high frequencies, there should be no uh, hysteresis loop at low frequencies as well, or constant values. We want to exploit different concentrations of tubule and microtubules in this connection and examine different frequencies. And finally, there's a very nifty experiment that can demonstrate without a doubt whether c and I are responsible for memoristic properties or not. Uh, there's an enzyme called um, septilicin, which basically cuts c and I from the microtubule we stabilize microtubules with taxol so we can remove c I, do the experiments without c I, and see if we still have stereosis. If it's disappeared, we know the, the culprit. And finally, actin filaments, also important, but I guess most of us here dismiss them as mainly structural elements. They don't have c I exposed. So if we have conductance, as, as I demonstrate, there is some conductance. Um, through my, uh, actin filaments, but no memristive aspect, and that would be what I would expect. And finally, analyze met networks, m introduce maps, re reconnect microtubules, and create electronic circuitry uh, artificially. This could be a bio um, bi evolvable computer down the road. Maybe the, our brain is an evolvable computer also. Well, thank you. That's all I have for you. Thank you, Jack. Questions? Regarding your treatment for GBMs that increase the prognosis from 14 to 24 months, my question regards timing. Was it done before or after surgery, chemo and radiation, and were those included or not included? I, I don't know. 
I don't know uh, specific details, but I, I, I suspect uh, they, they have not deprived the patients of the standard of care. So it's probably done in conjunction with chemo. Uh, and whether it's post, I, I don't think it's, mm, I don't know. I'm sorry. I, are it, they still ongoing? Yes. And in not only that, they are applying it now to different types of cancer, lung cancer and, and kidney cancer, I think, right now. So there's clinical trials ongoing with this. So how would one find the information on that? Go to novacure.com. Novacure. Uh, it, it, it's an amazing Thank technology you. which offers to the cancer patient something other than brutal medieval technology. Hi, yeah, um, I have tons of questions, but I'll ask just one, which is um, my computer refreshes its memory every 64 milliseconds, yet if I leave it on, its memory, its dynamic memory, is good for two years. Do you think this mechanism is a totally static system or is dynamically refreshed at some rate? Any, any feel for that? Um, I, I, I do believe it's dynamic. Um, the time scales I haven't worked out, of course, this requires this frequency dependence that we haven't done yet. We've done only for one frequency, so one kilohertz would be millisecond time scales. Uh, which kind of uh, c compares well with ion channel activity. But for long-term uh, long memory, and perhaps the calmodulin, or longer-term calmodulin kinase would probably offer, I don't know, minutes to hours. I'm not quite sure how, how fast this thing is. But when this, I hope, al allows us to, to uh, connect the different mechanisms together and start building a, a bigger picture out of it. Does the current flow uh Straight along the <coughs> microtubule or helically? Beautiful, beautiful question. I think it's both. This is actually the most in interesting aspect we haven't explored and maybe we will be able to because depending whether the, f the ionic flows are uh, uh, longitudinal along the microtubules or helical, both of which are uh, computationally possible, we've done simulations allowing this, there is a different aspect. And the, the helical aspect allows you to, to create um, magnetic flux, and Leon was talking about the, the definition of memristance, derivative of the flux with respect to charge. That explains why this is a memristive. It's, for memristive properties, you have to have helical flows, because you create a flux inside the lumen, and that flux depends on the number of charges on the C termini. So that is also uh, dependent on pH, ionic concentrations, protonation states, and so on. Uh, it opens up a completely astronomical number of possibilities. Oh, uh, lady behind you, please. I wanted to know what was the upper range of frequency that you have tested. You said that at higher frequencies, microtubules were not sensitive. So what was the upper limit of the frequency? Sorry. Did you hear? I, we couldn't hear you up here. Uh, what was the upper limit of the frequency that you have tested for the conductance? You said that at, at higher frequencies, microtubules or tubulins were not sensitive. Oh, okay, so, so yeah. At about one megahertz, I think the conductivity drops off uh, r rapidly because, as I said, this probably depletes the ions from this immediate area of microtubules. They have to be not completely condensed on the surface, but in the uh, sphere of influence, so to speak, about within one nanometer or so, if you push them outside, they will not feel the presence of... This is due to the device screening in uh, electrostatics of fluids. It's a well-known phenomenon. So, so there is very rapid exponential screening of electric fields in electrolytic solutions. So if you go to high frequencies and we see, we went only to one megahertz. Beyond that, I think you, you will not see any uh, measurable conducting effects. <clears throat> One thing just as a curiosity, how does it behave in a space uh, or a vacuum? Oh. Suppose of people who are going for a space astronauts. Oh. Okay, sorry, you can't do it in vacuum. The, the microtubules would not be stable uh, because, because they have so much negative charge, it, it, it'll blow up, uh, basically. So it's, unfortunately, that's one limitation. You cannot do it in dry state. Let's thank uh, Jack and Leon for two excellent talks.